let me introduce your host uh, for the next hour, uh, Misa von Tunzelman. Uh, as well as being a UCM trustee, uh, Misa is Head of Marketing and Communications at BNP Paribas Real Estate and Strutton Parker, uh, the BNP Paribas Group's two real estate brands in the UK. Uh, Misa is also involved in several charities and causes, uh, one of which you may well know, which is she is a trustee of the Eastside Young Leaders Academy. Anyone here involved in that? Okay, well, it's very much here in Newham. So, um, you know, M Misa is very passionate about uh, what she does with, um, you know, with young people uh, and is seeking to increase opportunities and inclusion for young black and Asian people in London. Uh, she was also a founder member of the Steering Committee for Changing the Face of Property, which is a cross-industry initiative which aims to increase diversity and inclusion in property, and she is an active member of the Freehold Property Industry LGBT Network. She was named on the Financial Times Top 100 Outstanding LGBT Leaders list in 2015 and 16, uh, and is one of the top 10 most inspiring LGBT leaders at the British LGBT Awards in 2017. I'll hand you over to your host, Misa van Tunzelman. Thank you, Ashley. I'm quite impressed with myself now. I don't know about you. Um, so, I've heard that the uh, session this morning was brilliant. Is that right? Yeah? yeah. yeah? Okay. Sorry? Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Right, so we're going to try and top that this time. Um, I hope you, you've all got your, your best questions on. You're all going to pay attention because this is basically, and I will tell you, this is a sales pitch. We want you all to come and work in property, okay? That's the plan. By the end of this, we want to inspire you to become students of UCEM and come and work in property. And the reason that this panel is going to do that for you is because we're talking about something that I think is quite important to you. Sustainability? Yes? Uh, yes? yes? Anyone not interested in sustainability? Yeah, well, that's good because sustain. No, 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 you're not. Come on, we've got to get the heckling better. Um, so the reason that sustainability is probably important to you is because it's about future-proofing our planet and our community, and you are the future, so that should be important to you. But what do you know about why, what sustainability means in the built environment? There's a question, I think, through the magic of technology, that should be on your clicker. Oh, I'm, I'm using my clicker, sorry. That work? Yeah. Everyone answered the question? <laughs> Everyone voted? How do I get the answers? Huh? Quite a lot. We can go home. Great. Job done. Wonderful. Well, that's good. 34% of you know quite a lot, 32 quite a bit, 20% uh, nothing. So the plan now is to try and get that up to 100% for number one. And we've got a fantastic panellists um, from across real estate and beyond who are going to talk to you about that. First up is Ben. Um, he's Senior Director for the Prince's Foundation and Director and Design Director for Stockbridge. Um, he's been an architect for most, if not all, of his career um, and is working on some of the uh, leading new buildings and community re regeneration, that's very hard to say, uh, projects uh, around the world. He's worked on about 50 projects and he's going to give us his perspective first. Next up is Louise. Um, Louise has had a career in research and consulting um, in real estate. In 2011, she started to specialise in sustainability um, and she currently works for Hammerson. Anyone heard of Hammerson? Yeah. Anyone heard of the Bullring Shopping Centre? Yeah, uh, so Hammerson own some of the best uh, retail real estate in the world, <laughs> including the Bullring. Uh, you can tell I'm in marketing, can't you? Uh, and last up, we've got Craig. Craig has been a campaigner for sustainability um, for his entire career, I believe. Um, and 2015, uh, he joined Friends of the Earth as the CEO. Everyone heard of Friends of the Earth? Yeah where well, you will do so shortly. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Ben first. We're going to try and keep the pace up for this. So each person's going to give you about so 10, 15 minutes perspective on sustainability in the built environment, and then we'll do the Q&A. Are you all with me? Yeah. Brilliant. Let's get it on. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, 
you're going to have a question soon, seeing as you've got these cle clever buzzers. But I thought, given we're talking about sustainability and particularly sustainable development, I'd better give you a definition. So what's interesting is it's basically my generation and the generation above doing things that don't make your lives worse going into the future, more or less, in terms of the sort of closed system we're in. But increasingly, when you look at it, the idea of the environment comes up again and again in different quotes. I've been, I was trawling different ones, and this whole idea about environmental sustainability is big on the agenda, and I won't go into that now, but I think many of you will be learning all of this stuff at school. So let's start off with a question, given this is about largely buildings. Two buildings, one in London on the left and on the right in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, and they're both, there it is, can you see those okay? So the one on the left in London, the one on the right, Kuala Lumpur, which do you think is the most sustainable of those types of uh, residential? Okay, so most people, two-thirds of the people thought the building on the right was the most sustainable. And I have to say, if you read a lot of the architectural magazines, global magazines, that's exactly what is attached to sort of smart cities. It's this idea that technology is the answer. And particularly if you cover buildings, uh, and bear in mind it's quite hot, those of you that have been in Kuala Lumpur, building glass buildings in hot countries and then covering them with leaves. <coughs> could be questioned, let's put it like that. Uh, concrete buildings, when you wander out of here, you'll see all over London, all over the world, lift shaft after lift shaft after lift shaft. Concrete, I think, contributes to something like 6%, if not more, of all carbon emissions. So building out of concrete is not necessarily one of the most sustainable things to do. Building glass buildings in hot countries isn't necessarily one of the smartest things to do. Covering things in leaves is good for marketing, but isn't necessarily <laughs> the most sustainable thing to do. It, it's sort of a trick question, because the building on the left is 300 years old, and whilst we might not be able to afford to live uh, low densities in houses like that anymore, because land's so expensive, it's been there for 300 years, so it has sustained. The materials are relatively local and low carbon. There will be timber floors, timber walls. Bricks, obviously, there's some burning that goes on with bricks, a bit of carbon, but they're, they're easy to maintain, and you can walk up and down the stairs. You don't need a lift. So again, once you start to see, you'll probably start seeing in your lifetime things like blackouts, electricity surges, you know, as we move towards electric, electric vehicles. And, and just think about it. When you're on the you know, 20th or 70th floor of a building and the lift's out, <laughs> it's going to be good luck. You're going to get very fit. So again, the answer is probably somewhere in between the two, but I just deliberately wanted to make the point that what people, how people are marketing sustainability is most people are realizing not the reality, and it's quite sad. So you've got to read, read into it and don't just take at face level what you're being told because it's often incorrect. This one <clears throat> is going to need a bit more explaining, but this, this is a plan, like a map, and, and what it's got is on the top of the diagram, which I've said is one, all the buildings are arranged, can you see, separately. So here you've got your housing, here you've got the business park, there's your primary school, secondary school, supermarket is the main road, big box retail. Okay, that's one way of organizing our buildings. So we've been doing that for the last 70 years, more or less, quite effectively. What, what's on the bottom of the diagram, two, is pretty much the same amount of buildings drawn in a different way, okay, in a more integrated way. Uh, and as you can see here, they, they sort of made these, the buildings are arranged to make these blocks and streets in between the blocks. So the question is, as, the, as it come up, which is the most sustainable way of arranging build, buildings in a town or a city? One or two? <laughs> Oh, <clears throat> well, I, I think uh, this one's less of a trick question, okay? I mean, some people might dispute and disagree, but I think those people that did too, 57% of you, I would say are right. The, the, the big difference, 
And the big difference is that um, the, the way we've been able to arrange our buildings all spread out like that is because we've had cheap fuel. So the top of the diagram is how you design a place if you're driving everywhere. But it's not only not very smart in terms of energy and fuel and childhood obesity because people are sort of sedent leading sedentary lives, but, but this type of diagram, which has streets and squares and avenues and boulevards, that creates public space, is better at creating a sense of community. People tend to bump into each other in the streets and all the things are integrated in, whereas obviously in a car, you can wave at someone going 70 miles an hour past. Uh, and it's, uh, community is a big part of sustainability. How we help ourselves and help each other as a society is a key part of sustainability. So it really is, it's not just about energy and it's not just about carbon, it's actually about how we as a human species live together in the most efficient way. So, so a town and a city is a very sustainable way. We build cities to, be, to make economies, to make goods and services, and we have to build them at a certain density so that we're close to one another and we can exchange things, material goods, culture, friendship, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'm just going to run through the rest. <clears throat> Those of you that have been doing well at geography or learning about global politics, we are about, and this, I still can't believe this fact, so people can fact check it, and, but, but, but it seems to be that in the next 35 to 40 years, we are very likely to build more infrastructure and buildings than at any other time prior to that in history. But, which takes some getting your head around. So it's like taking every single town and city in the country, uh, in the world rather, and building another one next door. Except the only problem is we're not doing that because the trend is towards less dense, more spread out settlements. So whilst we might be doubling the world's urban population in say 50 years, the footprint, the land that we build on, is likely to triple. So the impacts of that on carbon movement, the environment, are just absolutely huge. And so again, there was a sort of joke question, I think, at the beginning. <coughs> if, you know, if you want to save yourselves, then get into the built environment, because it's a big part of it. What, what's also likely to happen is out of that urban growth, that 2.3 billion or whatever, 18 times as much growth will be happening in uh, developing developing countries as opposed to already developed countries. It's a vast amount, and again, we've been doing some research into this. In a lot of those countries, there aren't the skill sets and the professions to plan. And so you've almost got the, you know, the worst nightmare is that you've got all the growth in the places where the people who might know what they're doing, not necessarily know what they're doing, uh, don't, have, you know, don't live, which is, a, which is a problem. So I guess I'm sort of gonna wrap up now, but leave you with this question. The, light, the sad reality and likelihood is that there's a lot of that growth. You know, it could be that half the world's urban population might live in informal settlements or what we call slums. Uh, but, but also, don't just say that if you've got planners, life will be good. We're doing a big project, a new town in Bahrain, and I can tell you all the traffic rules, all the rules that we have to build by are all the wrong rules. So <laughs> it's all very well to plan new cities, but actually, if you're planning them in the wrong way, it's almost worse, or it is, they'll be more impactful, uh, in a way, on the environment than doing it badly. Or there's a way of learning to plan, bring back streets and squares, and more efficient types of layered buildings that improve and enhance communities, and that's what a number of people are really focused on now. So, um, those of you, did anybody go on this, uh, any of these marches, the Extinction Rebellion? <laughs> I think my daughter, I know my daughter did because I opened the Independent the morning after the march and she was sitting on Traf the line in Trafalgar Square. So I was like, you are busted. Um, and I think my son did to Skyvoss School. But actually, what's great is the younger generation is starting to take control now. And it's terribly important because actually you're the ones who are going to be dealing with the impacts of what we're doing now. So the sooner you change the rules um, and actually start doing things differently, the better. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. That's a bit depressing, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, my name is Louise Ellison. I work for a, a property company called Hammerson, who none of you will have heard of because we are what we call a business-to-business -business, uh, property company. Um, uh, we're a business-to-business -business company. Um, so, what we do, we specialize in retail, as uh, Misha mentioned earlier. So, I'm going to talk relatively quickly this afternoon a little bit about what it is that Hammerson, what, what it is that we do as a business, 
because it, you're all interested potentially in working in built environments and we're very much a built environment business. What is it that we do? That we do? Um, what are the challenges that we're looking at? And there's a couple of questions for you to answer about what you, where you think those challenges are. And where does sustainability fit into that whole enterprise? So why is sustainability interesting for a company like us? So um, what is it that we do? We're a property company. So we're a listed company. Um, and we do, it's a fairly simple business model. Uh, we own land and buildings. So this is a site in Bishopsgate Goods Yard. Some of you may be familiar with the Bishopsgate Goods Yard. Some of you may walk past Box Park there. We own that, that, that site and everything behind it. It's one of the biggest sites left in London, in the city of London that hasn't yet been developed. It's a complicated site to develop. And we're in the process of going through planning for developing that site. So we own land and buildings and we develop them. We then operate real estate assets. So at the moment, all of the assets that we own, pretty much 99% of the assets that we own are retail assets. Big shopping centers, we own them here in the UK, we own them in Ireland, and we own them in France. And we own things like the Bullring in Birmingham. We redeveloped the Bullring in Birmingham 15 years ago. We still own it and, uh, and run it. Um, and we take a fee for running that. Um, so we make money out of running that asset. And we develop new ones. So that's uh, a shopping center called West Quay in Southampton. Um, we developed a big extension to that, which we opened in 2016. Um, so we do that all the time. We're developing new assets, we're taking the land, we're making more money out of it. We generate income, the business generates income from the rents that the tenants pay us. So all of those retailers that you go shopping at, all of those stores that you go to, they are paying us rent to take the space in our, in our, in our shopping centers. We increase the value of the assets and then we distribute the profit. So anybody who has a pension, anybody, um, you know, your parents, all of your families, your teachers, if any of them have pensions, they're likely to have shares in, a Ham have shares in Hammerson. So they will be benefiting all the time from the money that Hammerson is making. So it's a, it's a good thing for us to be generating those profits. And we're thinking, because of this, if you think about these assets, they're long-term assets. So if we're going to develop something, we, we developed, there's a shopping center in North London called Brent Cross, which we built about over 40 years ago. We built that then, we still own it. We have to make sure all of those assets are going to be able to deliver income for, for, for the business and therefore that we can distribute to our shareholders. And we need to do that for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Hamilton has been around for 70, over 75 years. We continue to want to do that. So that's, our, that's, that's our, our business model. That's what we do. So if we're going to carry on doing that for the next, the next 50 years, the next 75 years, then we need to think about some of the challenges. And this is a question for you. This is the first set of questions for you. I'd like to know, and there's no particular right or wrong answers here, but it'd be interesting to know from you, what do you think is the biggest challenge? And you've heard some things from Ben earlier about the challenges that we're facing. What do you think is the biggest challenge that's facing our built environment over the next 40 years? And bear in mind, that's your working lives. So what are the things that you're going to be facing with day in, day out, and which out of this list do you think is going to be the biggest? Okay, very good, really interesting, very interesting results here, um, really interesting. So, if we move on, and all of those things, you're absolutely right, I think one of the biggest things, and as Ben talked about earlier, we've got this huge increase in the amount of, uh, of urbanization, we've got a, we're expecting a bigger increase in, in population, People, more, more and more people are moving to cities. Um, and at the same time, we've got rising problems around climate change, which are meaning that a lot of people are, are, are being forced to move from the places they're, they're currently living. And that's happening increasingly. So all of those issues around climate change force us to an issue where we're going to be expecting more and more population shift, more and more immigration, people moving to different parts of the world. Um, and that can lead to huge rises in, in challenges in terms of social, co social cohesion. We also have increasing problems in terms of pressure on, uh, on our energy infrastructure, which Fennel also alluded to. Um, so all of these are things are affecting us, and they fundamentally affect the built environment. They're all going to be things that you need to be thinking about through your, through, through your careers. We're already starting to think about them, but you need to be very, very forceful in making sure that these are really being taken, taken into account. So things like carbon. We're starting to look at buildings. Buildings should really be 
um, looked at as power, generation, power generators and power stores. So those of you who are interested in, in, in engineering and, how, and, and electronics and how our infrastructure works, and I think you've had some presentations and some, some uh, uh, the, the displays outside this morning from, from engineering, you know, we need to be looking at what renewable infrastructure we can put on our assets, and, and, and as a business, we do that now. We have PV on most of our, on a lot of our shopping centres, and we continue to invest in that. And there's a lot more of that happening. You can see it in the, in, in the cities around you. New transport models. We know that car transport, the, the internal combustion engine, is a problem for us. Lots and lots of development is going into actually transitioning that, and the transition to electric vehicles is going much, much faster than anybody anticipated. With that, we will get new, 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 new ownership structures in terms, of, in terms of transport, as far fewer people see the need to actually own their own cars. You've seen the rise of Uber so quickly. You know, it's, it's not necessary for people to actually own cars anymore. Car sharing things becomes much more, of a, much more of an option. We also need to think about our public realm. So our public realm is um, fundamental for us in terms of absorbing that carbon. There's all sorts of issues our public, all sorts of um, benefits that our public realm brings for us in terms of health and well-being, but also just in terms of cleaning the air. So when you're looking at your public realm or when something's happening in your, in, in your community and what's going on around you, start asking questions about how is that actually going to bring benefits in terms of the, of the biodiversity of that, uh, uh, of that site. It's absolutely critical that we protect the biodiversity that we've got and we enhance it. We're going to have to start thinking about, and we are starting to think about, the circular economy, about looking at the resources that we have. How are they going to be used? Because at the moment, we have this massive increase in the amount of waste. We've seen a lot of, uh, of coverage of, of plastics, single-use plastics, and them ending up in the, in the oceans over the last few years. But just generally speaking, the amount of waste we produce is enormous. So we are going to have to start looking at how we recycle stuff much more effectively, which brings us back to that sharing economy. It's back to that issue about changing, changing ownership models, which we're seeing so much affecting, affecting uh, the, tra the, the, the car industry so, so quickly, and that starts to affect everything else. And if you think about the way you, own, you don't own your mobile phones, you expect, we expect our own mobile phones to be upgraded fairly frequently. They're not really ours. We're renting them. So we're giving them back. They're being recycled. A better one is coming along. That's happening all the time. It will happen to so many other things as we progress. And then we need, as I say, for these cities to be designed for, for, for health and well-being. They need to be designed for the people, particularly... Oh, someone's pen. Particularly, as we see more and more people coming into the cities, um, and we've got that issue around social cohesion, air quality, where are we going to source our food from? If you think about uh, the, Arab, the uh, Arab Spring that happened a few years ago, the Arab Spring started really because people were running out of food. So the, the initial um, uh, kickoff point of the Arab Spring was about lack of food. So if you think about, you know, where is our food going to come from, particularly where we've got, um, where we've got climate change issues, then um, urban farming, being able to have stuff close to you becomes a critical issue. And there's lots and lots of things going on in that area. So co co cohesive community, as you, as, you, as you so rightly pointed out, having a community with a voice, people feeling like they need to have a platform. So where these big, big, big areas and regeneration is taking place in city centers, making sure that people have a voice and can, can, can talk about what it is that they want that city center to look like is increasingly important. So make sure your voices are being heard. And you get there through education, you get there through participating, through taking your own ownership of those sites. Oh, so here's a question for you. Technology is, is seen as something of a threat often. And if you're thinking about what you're going to be doing over the next 20 years, they often say that all of the, your, that, that a lot of roles are going to, be, going to be taken by robots. So how many, oh, sorry. So yes, how many, roughly what percentage of jobs do you think could be done by a computer instead of a human in the next 20 years? Very good. The answer is 47%. So congratulate yourselves. So some of you may think that's a lot. Some of you may think that's a little. Um, it's quite a significant number. But what I think it does mean, can't think forward. What I think it does mean oh, is that our economy is evolving. And I think what you need to think about is what you want your role to be in that economy. Because we need this transition that we've got needs creativity. It needs different points of view and experiences. If we carry on as business as usual, we won't be able to solve the challenges that we've got. That's for you to do. Okay.
So, hello all. Uh, good to be here. Thanks so much for um, enjoying and, and taking in all your sessions today. Um, the question we've got today is what does sustainability mean to the future of the built environment? And what I want to suggest to you is, well, it's a question of choice. It's our collective choice, what it might mean, and our individual choice. Let's explore that through five themes. And the first one, I want to start straight in with a question. So just what do you reckon? What is the proportion of all trips made in Amsterdam on foot or by bike? Very good. Brilliant. I think you probably guessed, didn't you, that I was going to go for the highest. It is 67% of uh, journeys made in Amsterdam are made on foot and bike. It's much, much lower in most parts of Britain. The, next, the highest in Britain is, around, is, is in Cambridge, where I happen to live, and it's around 29%. But in London, it's much lower again. Of course, a lot more public transport in, in London, so people take tubes and buses, but really low. Did you know, in the Netherlands, I'll ask you another question and it won't come up here now, but in the Netherlands, what percentage of children do you reckon cycle to school? Anyone shout out? Okay. It's 50%. 50%. Half, half of all children cycle to school in the Netherlands. So hands up. Which of you managed to cycle school at the moment? <laughs> so I'm putting that at around, uh, I don't know, 3 4%, which is, uh, I do have a statistic for Manchester, Greater Manchester, it's 2%. So compare that to 50% in the Netherlands and 2% in Greater Manchester, and it looks like here. Now, of course, that's not just all individual choice. I'm sure many more of you would like to cycle to school if what? It felt safe, yeah? Because I tell you what, you feel a lot more freedom if you can cycle yourself to school and back, and you don't have to rely on a bus or to rely on tubes, and you can go when you want, and all those kind of things. So if it felt safe, if you absolutely had safe bike lanes, could cycle off-road, how many of you would like to cycle to school? Yeah, well, that's getting closer to 50%. So, there's issues here, isn't there, around sustainability. There's issues about the choices we make collectively as society as to where we invest infrastructure. Do we build bike lanes or do we build roads that make it dangerous to cycle? And then there's individual choices as well. But think what this actually means. One in six deaths in Britain is thought to be linked to lack of physical activity. In other words, people not getting enough exercise. So, in fact, if more people were cycling, if it made it easy and safe for people to walk and cycle wherever they're going, actually, very simply, it would save lives and it would lead to a healthier society. So, if we could have a built environment which makes it as easy and safe as possible for people to walk and cycle, it will lead to a healthier society and a happier society. And guess what else it would help? Tackling climate change. Yay, there's a good one. One of my top fan there. Uh, climate change, because actually transport is the source of the fastest growing emissions in Britain now for climate change. It's the one part of the economy where we haven't really tackled it at all yet. We've got to bring those emissions down. So it's good for our health to walk and cycle rather than drive, and it's good for tackling climate change as well. So active travel is a choice we can make as a society for better life, or we can decide and as individually, or we can decide not to do it. What about the second of my themes? And I would call it kind of access to nature. I would call it actually being in touch with the natural world, because more and more around the world, you're seeing that as more and more people live in towns and cities, actually they become disconnected with nature. If you actually never see nature, if you don't have access to trees and so on, actually uh, you lose that part of what it is to be human and be connected to nature. And this is borne out by research. You know, there's very clear research that people that are getting 
trying to recover from operations in hospitals get better quicker if they can actually see some trees from their hospital window rather than if they can't. And there's huge amounts of evidence as well that access to nature is really important for people's mental health. Do you know there's been a studies across towns and cities in the United States that even suggest that for every 10% increase in green space in towns and cities, that actually can extend people's lives by five years. So what we need to do is bring nature back into our cities. We need to be doubling the number of trees in our cities, not just planting a handful more. We need to make sure that where there's green spaces, not only are there lots of green spaces, but actually there's spaces that are good for nature as well. Even in this amazing sustainable venue here today, when I arrived, I saw the kind of green space outside. But actually, what I was thinking, it'd be nice if one of those was a bit more of a wildflower meadow as well, like they did in the Olympic Park and so on. You know, actually, let's make nature, let's make our cities nature reserves. Let's make sure we've got nature all around us. And again, that's good for our health, our mental well-being, and good for tackling climate change as well. And at Friends of the Earth, we're launching a campaign this summer to call for doubling the number of trees in Britain, double tree cover in Britain. Because again, that will be good for nature, but there's an astonishing statistic that it's actually we doubled the number of trees in Britain, that will draw down, suck carbon out the air, equivalent to 10% of the UK's emissions. That's huge. And it would take us from being a uh, Britain with 13% of our land covered in trees to 26%, and we'd still be below the European average. So we need to do that. Third thing, what about the materials we actually build our buildings with? Let's make them more sustainable. You know, there's growing evidence that a lot of the standard materials we use in our buildings, packed full of chemicals, made from fossil fuels essentially, steel, cement, concrete, that's not sustainable. And it's actually not always good for our health, but it's certainly not good for the planet as well. If we can replace those with natural materials, again like timber that comes from sustainable sources, that will make our buildings much healthier and again, will help tackling climate change. Do you know, it's been estimated that if you could build just 200,000 three-bedroomed houses in Britain every year on a natural timber frame rather than steel or concrete, again, that would lock up the same amount of carbon as 1% of the UK's emissions. And there'd be healthier houses as well. And don't think that timber can't work for big buildings. You know, in Vancouver, they've built a student residence that's 18 stories high out of timber frame as well. We're always going to need some steel. We're always going to need some cement, some concrete, at least for a few decades at the very least. But timber, if it's sourced sustainably, is something that I think could and should come back and be used a lot more in our buildings. I'll give you the fourth theme, and Louise referred to it. It's about sharing. Isn't it mad? that we all think we've all got to own our own versions of every product, particularly when it's been estimated that half of the climate emissions that are associated with us in our lifetimes are associated not with energy or transport, but actually the things we buy and the things we own. How many of you, put your hands up if your parents have got a, a drill somewhere in the house? And pretty much all of you. Full of, and put your hand up if any of your parents, if you reckon they use it more than, I don't know, twice a year? Yeah. Okay, there's some good DIY parents out there. That's higher than I thought. But actually, I myself probably, I have a drill in my house, and I probably use it like a couple of times a year, and really only really when I'm forced to. Would it be, would it be better if actually you had drills that work rather than the one that I've got that doesn't work, at least that's my excuse, um, and that we borrow them. We borrow them when we need them. And we can share them amongst several houses, and we can find mechanisms that allow that to happen. Cars we know about. Cars, isn't it crazy? Every family wanting their own car when you live in a built environment, and actually you can share cars. You can have car sharing clubs, and of course that's coming more and more. But think again how that will transform our built environment. If you don't need nearly so many car parking spaces, we can use those for bike parking. We can use that for nature, for green space instead. So sharing, sharing products is, again, something that will help build that sense of community and actually meet a much more sustainable lifestyle as well. And finally, 
really important. Let's put ordinary people in charge. Let's reinvent our democracy in cities. Let's give people the power to make sure that they shape their built environment and that the built environment and architecture and design becomes something that's done by people, with the help of experts, of course, but rather than something that's done to people. And I just want to say, in all of that, that does mean that that big question about what does uh, sustainability mean for the future of the built environment, it comes down to those choices, those collective choices that we make as a society and those individual choices we all make as well. And the choice we've got in front of us right now for the 21st century is we absolutely know how to make the built environment such better place to live and make, make sure that we have much better lives in front of us if we choose collectively and individually to do that. And I'll leave you with one final choice for all of you. And it is that if you want to, you can choose to be part of shaping that, a much more sustainable built environment. Some of you in this room, I'm sure, will end up choosing to be architects, designing the really amazing new sustainable buildings of the future, or planners designing the new sustainable built environment, or engineers, or community organizers, or campaigners like me, actually making sure that communities shape a much more sustainable world. It all comes down to these choices. You can choose to be part of a really bright, exciting, sustainable future, or you can choose not to be, but I'd know which I'd rather choose. Thank you. Wow, that was some inspiring stuff, wasn't it? Yes, well, you've, yes brilliant, I like you, you're a good heckler. Um, we, we need a few more voices now, because what we've got on the stage, and I feel very privileged to be sitting next to them, is three amazing perspectives and brains who have, have thought and worked in this field for, for, for some time. Um, so we are here, they, uh, to answer your questions, your thoughts. Don't be shy. Oh, great, there's one right at the back. I'm going to have to throw that up there. So uh, please, please don't be shy, but please be at the front. Um, uh, and uh, that was a joke. We do want questions from the back. Uh, but but let's, let's have your question out. If I throw this to you, can you throw it up? Uh, person at the back, can you put your hand up again? Right, we're going to get it back there. Go on. Pass it back. Pass it right back. Come on, right back. Right back. Throw it. Just <laughs> so, What's your question? Um, Come on. What's your question? Um, you know how you're talking about. I am. Yeah, we've got you. We can hear you loud and clear. You know how it's um, about transport and <laughs> talking about transport and how like we should um, start using, start walking and start like using public transport rather than um, transport that uses fuels, um, uh, fossil fuels. I think, it, like, how would you do that? Because, like, like, there's costs and then there's, you have to take in that some people have time, need the time and... Good, good, good question. Craig, is that one for you? How can people start using more, um, more public transport? Okay. I was. Your I'll do it again. I'll do it again. My, my question is like the cost. Like, how would you do? How would you? How can you make it cheaper? Like oh. diesel and. Yeah, that's, that's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> how would you maintain cost? So, very simply, uh, friends of the earth, we believe you have to make it cheap and safe for people to use public transport and to make walk and cycle, and then they will. One of the things we've been calling for is free bus travel right across the country, particularly, especially for everyone under 30, to make it as, as cheap and easy as possible for people to use buses, but all the same. And all the evidence from around the world shows, and there's hundreds of cities around the world where buses are completely free, all the evidence shows that makes a, a huge difference. So, you know, people choose these things if you make it cheap and safe. Thank you. All right, who's next? You know the idea about sharing, like, 
normal objects, yeah? How are you sure that's going to work? Because are people going to have, like, disagreements or, like, if someone breaks it, how are you going to be sure, like, what to do about it? Yeah. Anybody want to take that Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Ben? I think it's absolutely right. If you, if you think about, I think you mentioned the mobile phone, that you're, you're, you're really renting things and then you're maybe paying for the transmission or the energy. So with cars, you want to upcycle things. Other people might take an older model who don't care, but essentially the provider is, is selling you the energy and hopefully that's sustainable. So it's even likely to start in, uh, applying to things like floorboards and things in, ha in housing. But it will need to be reconditioned and upcycled because you're absolutely right. It can't just be broken and, <laughs> and rubbish and give to someone. So experts who will sell you the product, who, who you will have brand loyalty with, will likely take that product, upcycle it in some way, and then move it on to a different market. Thank you. And Louise? Also, if you're, if you're talking about sharing um, that, that we're hearing about here, we already do that with libraries. So there's a, there's a huge infrastructure of libraries, and you're just talking about tool libraries or libraries for objects rather than libraries for books. So it's perfectly possible to do. Um, and it's starting to happen. Um. Okay. Thank you. Should we go for the next question? Where have we got another question? Oh, there's quite a few down here. She's coming, she's coming. <laughs> We're going to get fit today. Okay. Oh, shit, I forgot. Okay, everyone, let's listen to the question. Okay, so basically, my question is, um, you said, you know, we were talking about like how um, you were talking about like things that we own like are quite bad for the environment. So I was kind of thinking like um, our mobile phones because if you think about it, um, they a hundred percent charge kind of like last maybe two days maximum um, or three days. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, <laughs> um, but then, you, like, very often you have to keep charging it, so how many times would you have to charge it in a week? Quite a few, a um, few times, so maybe, like, um, we could think of, like, a way on how to charge things that we, or make, like, sustainable energy for things that we owe, because especially at this day and age, a lot of people um, owe, like, own electrical kind of things that use a lot, a lot of energy and electricity. Okay. Yeah. Louise, you're up. No, wait, but like, basically what I was saying is, what, like, what is a type of, what could we do to kind of make this actually happen? Like, make it easier, if that makes sense. <laughs> Don't, I, so you've got two, you've got two things. You've got... Okay, okay, everyone, should we listen to the answer? Yeah, that, Come on, you need to listen because you might have another question you think is, is, is linked or better or different. You've so. got two things. So you're talking about making things more energy efficient so you have to charge them less. And then you're talking about the, 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 the electricity that we use to charge them is going to be, have to be renewable, all of which is happening already. And we, we, you know that the efficiency of your phones is getting better and better. So it might be lasting two days. You know, it might be lasting three days. The last generation of it would have, last, would have lasted less than that. So they're becoming more efficient. All of the equipment that we use at the moment it now is becoming more and more efficient. But at the same time, the, 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 the grid that provides our electricity, certainly in this country and in others, is becoming cleaner as we increase the amount of renewable energy that's being, that is being put into it. So the, the grid in the UK has, has decarbonized by probably 25, 35% over the last five to 10 years because of all that offshore wind that you see, all the PV we see across, it, across all the roofs. So we're not looking at a future where we can't use energy Energy is part of how we, how we live our lives. It's not going to go away. But we have to think about being more efficient. And some things are still inefficient, and buildings are one of them. Okay. Craig, did you want to? Yeah, I have to firstly say, your phone battery seems to last longer than mine. I can see that. <laughs> um, but the, yeah, exactly. But, but what I would say, that actually the biggest problem on things like that is not actually so much the electricity you, you, you have to use them, it's the huge amount of energy and resources that goes into making the phone in the first place. And then the real problem is, so many phones are really hard to recycle and, and there are bits in them. So there's a lot of pressure on phone manufacturers at the moment to design phones that can be made from the outset, that they can be dismantled and recycled, and to actually source the materials that are needed in, in making them uh, better in the first place. And that's it. Okay, so if I wanted to 
I, I think so. It is. Hello! Oh. <laughs> okay, now it is. Okay, so I want to ask the question to the um, gentleman who was talking about cycling. So, do you cycle to work? Oh, well, I think, I think, Ben, you might have to answer that one. So, I have photographic evidence here that I was the only person that cycled to this venue today. <coughs> that was very inspirational. Oh, it really touched my soul. And <laughs> 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 And, but it wasn't. But it wasn't a very pleasant experience because yep. the area around here is not. Back to your point, the area around here is not a nice cycling environment. I certainly didn't feel safe. It was actually quite <laughs> unpleasant, quite dangerous, and you, people just won't do it. World can cycle if it's that type of experience. Yeah, I certainly cycle two, three days a week to work at least. But it depends what else I'm doing. So. And this is why, um, to, to Ben's point earlier, it's so important that the plans that people make for cities and towns include infrastructure for all of this, so that you two don't have to risk your life cycling here. <laughs> Sorry. Can I also ask another question? So, um, you know, about cycling, <laughs> what... Shh. Guys, I do not appreciate this. Come on, come on. Oh, okay, um, what do you think is the alternative to cycling that reduces the same amount of um, carbon emissions? <laughs> Walking. 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 <laughs> okay, okay. ASMR, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Somebody take Who's next? Maybe a uh, gentleman behind? Ah. Come on, can we have some quiet, please? Quiet, please. Shh. Um, what is the worst and best part of your job? Oh, good one. Should we, should we, go, should we go through all three? <laughs> ben, do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, I'd say the, be the best part of my job is I get to work with local communities. So when we plan a place, we have the same kind of chaotic environment that we've got here with loads of people shouting and everything. And it's kind of fun. So we draw, we draw places with people and ask them what they like about their existing place, what they'd like to see more of. <laughs> The worst bit is, uh, is losing lots of money when you get things wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously doesn't happen to you very, very oh, much. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Louise? Um, I suppose the best bit of my job, one of the best bits of my job is coming and doing things like this. So being able to come and talk to people outside of the office um, and just different audiences. Um, that's a really, really valuable part of my job. The worst part of my job is probably reporting. We do an awful lot of reporting, being a, a listed company. We have a lot of transparency. We have to do a lot of reporting, gathering of data. That gets quite dull. Uh, yeah, best part is uh, out and about, doing things like this, meeting communities, um, doing radio, TV interviews, those kind of things. Worst part is in the office, dealing with budgets and realizing we can't afford to do everything we want to do. Yeah, business planning stuff. Yeah. Sounds like planning and reporting seems to be a bit of a no-no and losing yeah. money. Well, but <laughs> like it, but engaging like with it. people uh, and, and creating change is something that I think everyone seems to enjoy. I think we've got time for one more. Where are we going now? Oh, this, this gentleman in the middle. Um, in what ways can um, the younger generation sort of contribute more towards uh, building a sustainable future? What a fantastic question. Should we take an answer to, from that, to, from everyone? I don't know, uh, Louise, should we start with you? Oh. Sorry, on the, <laughs> on the spot. Well, it, it's, it's, in, it's kind of in your hands, I suppose. So not being afraid to, to challenge business as usual. Um, and there's so many of you, there's such a, such a lovely kind of diverse mix of, of people in the room here today. When I go back to the office and I, have, um, uh, and I go back and I see the most senior teams and the boards in my, in my office, they all look the same. And I think you could probably all imagine exactly what they look like. And that has to change. So I think one of the most important things that you can do is start challenging business as usual and start asking some serious questions about why people aren't listening to you. So don't be afraid ever to ask the question and, if you've, you know, and, and bring your voice, your creativity and what you're thinking about to the debate because what you think and feel and understand matters because you know so much more than you realise. Great answer. Ben? Yeah, well, keep asking the difficult questions because there are a lot of very, very clever people out there in the built environment at the moment, in my opinion, doing the wrong thing. 
and they've got five degrees, you know, they're well-respected people, but they're on a business, they're in a business that is sort of self-perpetuating the wrong answer. And uh, I remember one guy who had a big practice in America, who said it really well, he said, for my whole career, it feels like I've been climbing up this ladder, climbing up the ladder, climbing up the ladder, and now I've got to the top, I've got this big office, I'm head of the office, and I realized I put it up against the wrong wall. And I think, <clears throat> make sure you put it up against the right wall, ask the right questions, and do what we know works, and don't necessarily be fooled by things that, that patently don't work. So keep asking difficult questions. Well, it won't surprise you for me to say get active and campaign. Get involved with groups like Friends of the Earth, get involved with other organisations, do something, get involved in campaign out there. And actually what I'm finding, myself and others that have been campaigning for years are incredibly excited about this generation showing much more passion and activism than we've seen for years. And the Maybe the teachers in the room won't like me for saying this, but I do think the school climate strikes have been absolutely fantastic for transforming the politics around these debates. But if you do get involved in school climate strikes, you've got to make up and study harder at the weekend instead. Great, thank you. Well, I think, the, I think that, was, that was the last question we had time for, but I think that was a great way to end. You know, you guys can make the real change for the built environment from the, and for the environment. Um, so I hope that some of you have been inspired by what you've, what you've heard there to put your ladder up against the right wall and campaign for the future. Thank you.